very excited to have Carl Jesus with us today closing the series. Carl will be introduced by Leila Arafe. Leila is an architect based between Kuwait and Beirut. She's an alumni of the architecture school in AUB and her interests cross over between fine art, art history, architecture and urban design. Leila is also my sister and I'm very happy to have her moderate the talk today. Thanks Lara and hi everyone. It's a pleasure to introduce Carl, who also graduated from the American University of Beirut with a degree in architecture. Carl is a Lebanese musician and architect and is best known as Meshruar Leila's drummer. But he actually plays a much bigger role in the creative process. Something interesting is he also composes and he's part of the art direction of the band's visuals and the stage designs which we see when they're on tour. Because he wanted to stay in close connection with the new generation of architects, he served as a jury member many times in the architecture school. He's been an active member of the Arab Center of Architecture since 2019. And we've seen him on the covers of Architectural Digest, Rolling Stone, and many others. So thank you, Carl, for joining. How are you doing? Thank you for having me. I'm good, I'm good. How are you? Good, thanks. I know you're in Paris right now, Yeah. but you made a decision to stay in Lebanon. You're one of the creatives who chose to stay there despite what's happening uh, politically and economically. And you actually launched your studio, Carl Georges Architects, early this year. Could you tell us about your decision to do so and how's it going? I wanted to, it was a long process because, because I wanted to, to, to launch my own studio for a, a while. And because of, you know, the touring with the band and the constant uh, traveling, I wasn't able to do so. So in a way, because of COVID, you know, I was stuck at home and I thought, why not launch it now? Even though I, I don't think, you know, in, re in retrospect, it's not the best timing, mm. but uh, I just went with, with uh, I just went with it. And actually, it, it's it's funny because uh, the cover of Architectural Digest helped helped me in a way. You know, it pushed me. It 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 set a deadline for me because I I need to launch my studio before the magazine was out. So in a way, uh, <laughs> Architectural Digest helped me. I say to to stay. In, I chose to stay in Beirut because you know it's my city it's where i the city is me the the most even though i'm in paris now um i i had to get out of it for from it and then in february the last couple of months were really heavy and really uh, difficult for us physically and mentally and psychologically so i needed a break but i'm going back and i'm like continuing to resist <laughs> i guess yeah so realistically, there are so many things right now that can bring you down in Beirut. But how are you keeping up? Like, what's a day in your life like in Beirut? Everything, literally everything brings you down. Even, even if you try and build something like a bubble where you can be comfortable and where you can work and get inspired, it, the, like it still gets you, you know, like we have electricity problems and internet problems and w w like v very basic stuff that that removes your focus even though I, I i you know when i design my place in beirut i try to take into account you know everything that could happen wrong mm -hmm. i didn't plan the 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 explosion though <laughs> i didn't use tempered glass <laughs> it was my only uh, my only mistake but like everything like my apartment is completely is completely isolated from the noise and the air is filtered and I have a central UPS to be able to, you know, to have electricity 24 seven. And even with all of this, it's been really difficult to live in Beirut. And especially when, you know, there is a really negative energy because of the, the of COVID, the, the crisis, the economical crisis, because of the destruction that happened, we completely lost our repair, our, our forgot the, the word. Sorry, yeah, it's amazing that you still uh, decided to stay there and you're working and uh, it's actually the, the year you launched your studio and uh, I think we see a lot of your work on uh, social media these days. Yeah, I mean, especially because we, we, we lived something together, you know, with along with my friends and my family and my neighbors. 
when you live something that intense and that traumatizing, it gets you closer. And it's the same with, with the band, you know, with Mashra Leila, when we face so many problems uh, for the past uh, f- five years, we even got closer. You know, when you, li- when you go through really difficult times, you feel that you belong more to, you know, to the people that are facing this with you. And this is what I feel uh, towards, you know, my friends and my family in, in Beirut. So I, I feel like if I end up leaving, I would be abandoning them. And this is not something I like to do. Well, I'm really excited to hear about your work. And before we go through your projects, I want to show a photo. This is the picture I wanted to show. And I think it says a lot. <laughs> and the one yeah. after. Yeah. So it seems like music goes way back. Did you ever consider a career in music before Mashru Alayla? No, no. It's not in the culture in Lebanon, you know, like my family and my parents never really, even though, you know, they were really cool. They, they bought me my first drum set and my neighbors still hate me <laughs> until today and still hate them for this. But, they, you know, they, they, they never really thought that I, I would, you know, have a career in music. It's not a common path to have in, in Lebanon. And I think in all the Middle East, they really so you know, pushed you me towards engineering. I, it was a completely, like, unexpected thing that happened. We met in architecture and design school, and we weren't planning you know, on, on, on having a band. We just met because we were spending time in a department and you should know that because you also did architecture school, you like you completely are disconnected from everything that you did before, you know, so we stopped, we all had, you know, our different bands and we all performed and played music, but because of architecture and design, we had to uh, tone it down and, and Mashra was a way for us to communicate and create music and just happened it, we weren't really planning on having a band and and touring and releasing albums etc so yeah this picture this this was my first drum set that my parents bought me when i was two i think two or three <laughs> so there is an obvious intersection between music and architecture in your life as i mentioned you were you're the drummer composer you do the visuals of the stage so I think a question most of us are thinking of is how do you balance between architecture and music? Like it's uncommon for most people to balance two careers. So how do you switch between the I two? I think they complement each other in a way because there are two fields where you have to be inspired almost all the time and like humanly it's impossible. So, you know, as soon as, I, as I'm, I'm stuck, or, you know, I'm, I don't know, writing a song, I just switched to, to architecture and I just, like, I go back and forth between the two fields. And now, in a way, they're, they're similar, you know, the approach to songwriting or, or the approach to designing a project, almost the same uh, for these begins with brainstorming and analyzing the context and the, the intention behind the, the piece that you're creating. So I, I really do the same for uh, like a musical composition or for project. And you know, it, it, it also when, when you, you're performing and you're touring and you, you, you finish a tour and you go back home, it's good to have something to, to, you know, to keep yourself busy, busy with, or else mm-hmm. you, you really go into deep, <laughs> deep depressions because like the lifestyle is so hectic, is so uh, filled with people and interviews and events. And suddenly you're, you're, you're back in Beirut with nothing. So it's good that I have something, you know, to, to you know, explore other something things. To and to, to Exactly. I think this takes us to your uh, first project, which is Villa Shams. And it's such a gorgeous and impressive project. And we've seen a lot of it on social media uh, recently. So what's the story behind this? What can you tell us? Actually, this uh, I, I started this project in 2017. And when I knew that uh, the site was in Baalbek, it immediately, immediately, like, you know, I felt something because Baalbek is the place where we started, where we played one of the most important concerts with, with the band. You can show actually the picture. So this was a concert in 2012, I think, in, in Baalbek. So Baalbek really meant meant a lot to me and it was really like the city and even before me you know the romans decided to have one of their biggest temples there and 
And the temple of Bacchus where we performed was the temple of partying basically and uh, drinking, etc. So, so like like conceptually, Baalbek was like a really strong, uh, a really strong element for, for for me when I started designing the the villa. And also my thesis when I like I was working on my thesis in UB, I also worked on the relationship between yeah you can say on this image between music and and architecture how they are interconnected. I'm not going to go into details, but basically there is Xenakis, who's an, he, like, he's an architect who worked on, um, there is also Le Corbusier who worked with Xenakis to develop the facade of La Tourette in, 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 in France. And he basically worked with the proportions and sequences to, uh, to refer to music. And I, I actually worked on the same, you know, like when you write a song also, it's the same principle, you have a grid, you have, a grid that is subdivided into beats and each beat is like either four or three or five subdivisions. So I, I worked with this to create, to create like the, the main facade of the villa. That and also the site. The concept. Yes, I, I, you know, it's funny because like it's all connected, interconnected, my thesis and the concert in Baalbek. And this is a sketch of the, of the stage <laughs> that I did. Uh, it was in 2012. When you were yeah. performing? Yeah, so, yeah, so this is us on stage, and we were seven. We had Maya playing the keyboards and Andre playing the guitar. Uh, they, they left us. But you, you can see, like, when you enter the Temple of Bacchus, you have the stairs. So the stage was, was already uh, designed in a way, so we just had to create uh, different platforms and, uh, like, a big uh, backdrop, like a screen behind us. So it was like interesting to have those layers of people and different elevations yeah. during the concert. Uh, to come back to the to the uh, villa, the site was really amazing because it was completely uh, wild and untouched for like millions of years. And uh, like the idea also behind the villa is was that I didn't want to alter or change the site. I wanted to achieve something that really that's really respecting the context. Like, uh, you know, the, what the Roman temple achieved, in a way they're massive, they're huge, but they perfectly blended with the surroundings. And this is what I wanted to achieve uh, with, with the, the villa. It no. fits yeah, so, so the, perfectly the, with the surrounding. It's, it's so harmonious, yeah, it's, the I, building with the landscape. Like I worked on the landscape and on the interiors and on the, on the, on the villa, like on the everything. And, you know, I don't understand when you have already like when nature has already done the work for us like the garden is already there you know i didn't have to remove everything and replant you know with trees that have nothing to do with the site i decided to keep the rocks and the stones that were on site and the olive trees and the sobej the, the um, cacti yeah so uh, and i just worked around around it so in the bathrooms you'll see that in the bathrooms you have rocks literally uh, serving as walls and you can see that inside the pool, you have rocks uh, touching the water and you have those different relationships to, uh, to nature. So sometimes nature enters the house, like here you have an indoor garden with a skylight and sometimes you have literally a rock covering the window. Materials were important here, like to remember with, with the surroundings. We uh, used, you know, uh, earth from es the es excavations that we mixed with the concrete to give it this uh, brownish reddish tint that is really specific to the region of Baalbek that is really uh, arid and, and, and desertic. And yeah, we so also used uh, the, the aggregates, you know, the pool is made, made out of terrazzo and most of the terraces outside are made out of terrazzo and all the, the aggregates like the pebbles and the rocks, etc., come from, from the site. Yeah, so sorry. is this you trying to source everything, uh, source most materials locally? Yes, and that was before to... the crisis, and now it makes more sense, you know, to use local materials and local know-how. Is did the villa, did the project turn out the way you envisioned it in the beginning, when you first started imagining and looking for inspiration? Did you have this in mind, or did it change? Um, I had this in, uh, this in mind, but you know, when you work with uh, constraints and with nature, you can't really plan everything ahead. So 
I had some good surprises and, and others that aren't that good, but like from the good ones, uh, um, you know, with with the contact, the contact with water changes the color of of the material. So it's really nice to see that the materials are alive. Uh, so mm. the column, the concrete columns going inside the pool became a bit uh, greenish, which I, I love. Like I love, the, you know, when material materials start to age and interact with the surroundings. This was yeah, really you nice. You can feel this history and the aging. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't want to have, you know, this pristine and uh, perfect lines. I wanted the, 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 the villa to age. And it, mm. it's something that I usually do in my approach in architecture. You know, most people don't like using, uh, you know, uh, marble or a hardwood because, you know, if you drop a, a drop of oil on it, it does, a, you know, it stains. And I feel that this is the, the beauty of this material because they, they age and they, they, you know, our grandma, uh, grandmothers had Carrara marble uh, kitchen tops and now they look like they've lived 50 years, you know. And I think it's charming to have, to have these uh, this qualities. It feels like your architecture is really honest, just like your music in Mishra Leila. You're not, um, Thank you. you just, your <laughs> lyrics are very, uh, it's the truth, you know, it's, uh, you speak the truth, you speak honestly, and your architecture reflects that as well. I guess it's something that I learned with, with the band, with Mashra Leila. It's, we never really tried, you know, to uh, target audiences just to grow more or to talk about uh, subjects that might sell, but, you know, and the, the, the proof is that we're banned from... <laughs> Most, most, we're not allowed to perform in, in a lot of countries because of that, because we don't really uh, censor ourselves or, you know, we, we can't, actually it's impossible for me to create something I'm, that doesn't resemble me or that I'm not convinced with. I'm going to skip to the next project, the Lanadia. We can't really ignore the political situation and the economic situation in Lebanon. And you mentioned last time that the older generation of architects was inspired by the civil war in Lebanon. And it feels like what's happening now is, is, is just repeating itself. So how are we responding or how do you think you're reacting differently to what's happening? You know, even though it's very tough to detach yourself from, you know, until the explosion, I was able to have a different conversation. Like I, I, I've managed to stay far from, you know, this, the, the discussion that goes around war and destruction, etc. But to, when I lived, I personally lived the explosion. It's very tough for me to talk about something else, but I feel that we have yeah. like the young generation of architects and designers and artists. I think they have to go out of their way to, try and change the discourse and the narrative because it, like you said, like it's been repeating itself for the past uh, 60, 70 years. So I think we're all sick, you know, even when I'm in Paris, all my friends are like, okay, you're Lebanese, so war inspires you. And even with Mashra Leila, you know, like we always talked about bombings and, and checkpoints and, and problems actually, just about problems all the time. And especially with architecture, I mean, at the end, it's buildings that are inhabited where people live and they have to be warm and cozy and sensitive. I don't think that they should be uh, reminding us of war and destruction and they shouldn't be dark, dark places. I think yeah. they have to do the counterbalance to the destruction that's happening. So instead of just holding on to the past, you're trying to look for a new like a fresh approach, basically. Yeah, at the same time, you know, we had our ancestors, our history, and like we have to learn from the, the you know, the people who came before us. For example, Villa Nadia is an old traditional Lebanese house in Beit Mere, and you can notice that it doesn't have a lot of glass and windows are really small in comparison to the first. And I think they, they anticipated, you know, this, if Ashrafi and Beirut was all built this way, I don't think there, there would be so many casualties and so much destruction. I think those, the, the proportion, like, and we live in a country where we have a lot of sun and a lot of, uh, like the summer is really long. So using a lot of, gla lot of glass doesn't make sense. So either way, this is a house in, 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 in Beit Mere and I wanted uh, 
I actually worked on the renovation of the house and on the, I added some parts. <clears throat> the house was completely destroyed and it was abandoned for 40 years. And then squatters were living there. So the interiors were ruined, completely ruined. So we had to redo everything. And I worked on four, four different additions. This is the, the um, house. It's like a, pavil a floating pavilion uh, between the pine trees. So this is why it's made out of timber and it's a lightweight structure. So, and it all opens up to the, uh, the pine trees. So you're literally perched between the trunks. And I decided to use green velvet and like really um, colors that reminds you of, of trees and nature. And the two chairs are made out of uh, wool booklet. Is this the image or is it to render? No, those are renders. Those are renders. It's still under, under constru construction. So no, this is there also rendered. This is, yeah. So this is this is the the, the house, the, the conditions of the house. So you can see that mm -hmm. some of the furniture is still still there, and I wanted to keep them. Did so you re we, reuse we worked a lot. the furniture? Yes, yes. We we worked a lot with local artisans that are ninety years old today to oh, restore wow. uh, to restore the the red tile roof and the carpentry and the doors and windows, etc. And this chandelier, for example. Yeah, so this is the chandelier, the original chandelier, and uh, the walls were, mm -hmm. were uh, painted in green inside the house. So I wanted also to keep this, but here it's like a wallpaper, a fabric uh, wallpaper. And this is the dining mm -hmm. room, and it also gives to on the left. It is an addition that I added. You can see it from the back facade. If you go, go back like two pictures, you'll be able to see it. Yeah, so this is it. Yeah. It's such a gorgeous house. And Thank I you. think that's the extension on the right side. Yes, exactly. This is the extension. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the, the last thing is the spa. Uh, there is a cross fault that was used. Uh, this is the library. Uh, yeah, so the, there was a cross fault underneath the house that was used for mainly for storage and there was a water tank. So I turned it into like a personal, like private uh, spa. You have a small jacuzzi in the center and the sauna and the hammam. And the idea here was I wanted to turn this, these cross vaults into a cave. So it's all plastered with the same material. Uh, it's a Tadelac, it's a, a Moroccan kind of plaster. So the floor mm -hmm. and the walls and everything are plastered with the same material. And in the center, you have this the jacuzzi that I wanted it to, to, to look like a gem, you know, that is reflecting greenish reflections uh, all over the, the, the place. Yeah, there's so much focus on the jacuzzi in the middle when you kept everything, yeah, it, uh, the same material. Yeah, so it was in the intention to have this greenish emerald uh, color in the center and all the rest are really earthy, earthy and shiny. Yeah. So this is the Kana guest house. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to scroll through the pictures. What's the story behind this one? This are one these, uh, is uh, photographs. Yeah, yeah, those are photos. As you can see, the site is really uh, rocky. So mm -hmm. the, the, the house is plugged into this massive rock formation that is really old because the rocks were, were originally yellow. And with time and with rain and erosion, they became uh, gray. So we actually used local stones to build the house and it looks like it's ye yellow, even though the stones are gray, but because when you break them, they become yellow. And it looks like I wanted, wanted it to look like a monolith, like a retaining wall. And actually from, the, from behind, you can see it now, but like photos will be re released soon. From behind, it's open to a large courtyard and it's from there that it gets all the light. And it's, I wanted it to really look really private from the side and from the other side, from like you're, it's completely open to the rocks and the rocks that really like come inside the house. And there is also a small uh, spa. I don't know, no, I don't know why I love, I love uh, spas. There yeah, is a small and spa and there is a small uh, wine uh, cellar. Did you face any difficulties in this one when they were constructing? 
No, it was really easy actually because uh, like materials were l l literally taken on site and it's very simple. It's concrete and stones. No, it was a really simple and straightforward project. And it just blends in the landscape. It's perfect. It yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's low profile. The, like I want it to be really very neutral and very uh, subtle. It seems like your projects are not intrusive. They're all, they all respect the context and the site. Yeah, I mean, it's my approach. I always take time, you know, to get to know the site, to get to know the client. And context is really important because especially nowadays, you know, I think we noticed with, with COVID that being mindful of what's around us is really important and having, respecting nature, respecting, uh, and the qualities of the spaces come directly from nature, from the lighting, from the sun, from the temperature. So if you build, a building that is all glazed in the middle of, you know, a very hot city. It doesn't make sense. You can't live with only a C uh, 60, 70% of the time of the year, of the year. So you need to be contextual. Common, and though. yeah, it, it became a reflex, sadly, you know, it's the standards and you just you don't try to think out of the box, I guess. Like the client here told me, oh my God, how, how, we don't have windows, you know, how, how are you building a house that is completely closed? Did they accept this? this? Were they, were yes, they this is, easy to convince? It was difficult to, to convince them because, but then it makes sense because this facade is facing the south. So it's exposed to the sun all day long, you know, and, and the whole, whole idea was to shelter the space with this massive wall. It's like 50, 60 centimeters thick. And from the other side, you know, you have this fresh air coming in and the light and everything. And it also gives you, it's like, it's all about convincing them and it's different point of views. And at the end, I think if you have the, the right arguments, uh, it can work. I'm really excited to hear about this project. And when I see those photos, it just makes me want to be in, in Beirut. I, Thank you. It, the, your choice of materials, the furniture, your layout. How did you tra transform this space? I imagine it was an abandoned uh, yeah, actually, right? I don't know. I, I have something with abandoned apartments and old buildings. So the building is from the 30s. Uh, it's an Art Deco building in Ashrafiye. And when I found the apartment, it was abandoned for 10, 10, 15 years. I don't know. And literally, it was raining inside the apartment because there was a hole on the roof and the windows were not really very stru structurally uh, stable. good. Stable. And there was hole, holes in the wall because of, how do you say, uh, as if. <laughs> yeah, from the, from the war. From the war. From the war. <laughs> That's the yeah, easy exactly. way to say it. It's the easy way to say it. So, yeah, so I immediately, immediately fell, fell in love with the, with the place and I saw the potential that it had. And it took me two years to finish it because I was working in between tours, etc. You know, I also got the furniture from all around the world, like the furniture and the, the pieces, the, the, the objects, etc. And the, the whole idea was that I wanted to build this bubble that I talked about, you know, to feel that I'm inside my space and that I can spend time there. You know, when I'm, 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 I'm in Beirut, I don't go out a lot. I like spending time in my apartment to work, to write, to, to uh, also work on architecture. For the furniture, you chose some, like, I'm guessing, classic pieces. And then did you yes. design some others? Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of Jean Prouvé. He's a French uh, architect. So I have some pieces from Jean Prouvé, like a lot of pieces from Jean, Jean Prouvé. And a lot of local designers that I love and admire, like David and Nicolas Vézes in this picture, for example. This is my, my turntable. And I also, you can see that there are lots of plants it's really important for me to, you know, to have also nature. If, even if you're in the middle of the city, you can find a way to bring nature inside, inside your house. Uh, this is the kitchen where I was actually when the explosion happened. I was standing here. I was cooking and... In this kitchen. Yeah, I was standing here and when, when everything happened. Now, it's good that I, I had those it pictures. I hope wasn't damaged, yeah. It was damaged. It's good I have those pictures because it will never be the same again after what happened. Even though I'm going to, yeah. I worked two months on fixing it, but uh, it aged very quickly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so this is the main space. So it's one 
the whole apartment is a square. It's a perfect square. And this is why I, I love the plan also because it's a 10 by 10, 10 and a half by 10 and a half square. Yeah. And all the spaces are organized around two terrazzo volumes. One is the library and one is the, the guest bathroom. And everything happens around those two volumes. So yeah, you can, I have um, a question. When you look out your window or your, your terrace, what do you yeah. see and what do you feel looking at Beirut? Think, did I send you a picture? No, Is maybe this not. The, I, actually, the, the apartment, I, I'm, no, no, I'm, go, I'm going to show you. No, no, I'm going to show you a picture from my phone. If it's, I don't know if you can see it. So, okay, my <laughs> It's a bit complicated. I actually have an amazing view on two uh, traditional houses, Lebanese houses that are still standing uh, despite the, the explosion. And they've been abandoned also for, I don't know, for maybe 50 years. And every day, you know, you have birds. It's really, and it has a garden. It's very rare to find a garden in the middle of Ashrafiye. So this is what my view. I actually have two uh, traditional Lebanese houses. And a lot of skyscrapers and buildings from the 60s and the 70s. It's very eclectic. Like the mix is really very rich. And the day of the explosion, unfortunately, like when I the first reflex was hide in the in the bathroom, and then I went out to the balcony to see what actually happened. And there was this like orange fog, and it was really uh, dusty. And all the buildings were windowless, like literally all the glass was on the streets and the cars were crushed and people were, it was horrible. But like I had a view of a panor panoramic view on all the, the destruction. When you go back to Beirut, like now you're in Paris, is it more of a sad experience or are you like, are you optimistic about rebuilding when you see this damage and the whole situation it's, on the ground? It's definitely extremely sad. <laughs> mm -hmm. I try, I like, I I'm, I'm optimistic in nature but like what happened is beyond what you can like a human being can handle you know I know that I'll be able to reconstruct rebuild my apartment but it's not that it's like the whole city like it's going to be impossible to rebuild everything the way it was it would and you know we all had our habits like our life in the neighborhood all those shops and restaurants that we loved are completely gone and uh, not because of the, the crisis, economic crisis, but because of the explosion. And it's going to take a while to, you know, to, to, to rebuild everything and to heal psychologically. It's not just about you know, rebuilding uh, the, the fabric. It's, it's about also healing. And I have so many friends who were like, they were living inside the, the, the buildings where people died. So it's tough to, to go back and live the way yeah, the we were psychological living. effects i can't of imagine course. how much how it's very tough but you're working with george arbid on the arab <laughs> center of architecture and it's i think the aim is to raise awareness about architecture and urbanism so um just for people who are unfamiliar could you talk about that a little bit yes so so, so basically uh as an architect, also, I, I felt, you know, I had um, uh, uh, not a responsibility, you know, to, first of all, help my friends who got their apartments like, completely destroyed, but to also raise awareness because, okay, there are those beautiful, uh, sexy buildings that, that, you know, those red tile roof buildings that everybody's yeah, trying to save. But there are also buildings that, aren't that traditional, they're more modern, they're from the 50s, 60s and 70s, they're brutalist, they're made out of concrete and people doesn't necessarily know that they're important and iconic. So uh, with Georges Arbid, we try to uh, archive and document the destruction, for example, at EDL, Electricité uh, du Liban, which is a building that is amazing. Like engineering wise, it was really a, a, a very, uh, um, ahead of its time and it was like literally 400 meters away from the explosion and it didn't the structure is still there it's still standing it has minor minor uh, uh, minor um, uh, cracks Damages. but it's it's fixable 
So it's it's really a, a gem. It's a it's an engineering masterpiece, and people don't really know that. So we we documented this building, and we try to put the, res the the people who are responsible of the building in touch with people that know how to fix those type of buildings and who work with the techniques that were used uh, in the 60s, etc. To are avoid, these you know, pictures from the, the building? Are, yes, this, those pictures are from the 13th uh, floor of the L. So, so this is looking towards Madame Khayel and our back to, yeah, and this is from looking towards uh, Ashrafiye. Mm. So like I showed the 360 views from, from, from the L. And there are lots of pictures that we took inside the building that are uh, private because they're a bit sensitive and they show a lot of like personal destruction and there is a lot of you know ha bloody hands on the walls and and yeah. name it and written statements. It, it was yeah, it was really yeah, and out of respect to to the victims, we didn't really want to show them. They're just for sure. archiving uh, purposes. So you're continuously working with, with the Arab Center, the AC. Like I try when I have time, when I'm in Beirut, I love spending time there because uh, George is great. He, like, he taught me in AUB and I love you know, spending time with him. He's, he's, he's a physical archive. He's, he's really, he knows about right. every building in Beirut, literally. And he has an amazing collection of books and drawings. I can spend really hours there just looking at drawings and models, etc. So yes, when I have time, I, I, I spend enough, a lot of time. Someone's asking, who is your design inspiration? Um, I don't really have a design inspiration or musical inspiration. It's a bunch of artists and like, it depends also on the time, you know, I, I, I consume a lot of music and it's more experiences that inspire me, I think. And the time I spent in, in Vals, which is a spa designed by Peter Zumthor in Switzerland, really like you can notice that I, I try to plug a spa in, <laughs> on, in all the projects I work on. Uh, my experience there was amazing because the, the space is, I know, you have to check it out. And if you can go there, you should all go there because it really changes you. It's a, it's a, it's a bath that is built um, on the in, like on the slope of a mountain in Switzerland, and it only uses uh, minerals coming from the site. Also, it's uh, um, volcanic uh, rocks, and it has five different baths that are that only use natural heated sources of water. It's really nice. The whole experience is designed, and the lighting is 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 controlled in a way that is mind blowing. You should definitely go and, and see it. We have a question from Dunya. Carl, if you could build your city, what would it look like aesthetically? Would it be different districts in different styles? You spoke about working with nature, so maybe each district blending into nature? I don't really know. It. I never thought about uh, designing my own city. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love the, the pattern that's built. I think the fact that, you know, when you have someone who has the vision like uh Osman, who had the vision and actually designed the city on axes and set etc and he designed the blocks and the he even shows you know uh, the materials that yeah the, um, yeah paris it shows all the materials that were um there were going to be used um i feel like the, the city is really special because you know it shows that it has one vision and you can stand uh, yeah, on, on the axe and see the whole um, perspective of the city. Um, I don't know if I, had to re if I had to rebuild Beirut, I would do it differently, I think. There is no urban study, like there is no planning inside the city. It's just, this is why you have so many different types of buildings and buildings from the 30s and from the 60s and new buildings and some buildings that, that are disfigured and there are no rules. It's like literally, um, and that's like the there are no laws. charm of the city at the same time. There are no laws, but that's the charm of the city, but it's not stable, you know, that because sometimes you feel that, okay, it's amazing, but two years later, you have another building that ruins completely everything. But you have moments that 
you, I think that are beautiful inside the city. One comment is, wish your work is more accessible to general public. And uh, then Nude is asking, how easy or difficult is it to gain ownership over the abandoned buildings? Do previous owners need to be contacted or are they owned by the city? No, they're not owned by the city, unfortunately. Unfortunately, at the same time, because if they were owned by the city, God knows, I, I think they would have destroyed them a long time ago because they're owned by, actually because they're owned by families and you know, the, the sons are all over the world. The buildings are abandoned. It's very tough to buy them because they have different owners and they're a bit stuck, you know, in time. And in a way that this is what's saving the buildings. Um, like my, my apartment, for example, was owned by five different owners and I had to, but they were all living in Lebanon. So I had to go and talk to each and every one of them and convince them that I wanted to buy the house and the mother had a designer. She didn't want to, she didn't want to sign the, it was very complicated. Usually it's very tough to buy uh, old, old property in Beirut. It's really tricky because you have different owners, they're in different places. And sometimes the prices are insane. But you managed, I think, and you transformed it completely. So I wish we could do I was that really lucky. for more. I was really and lucky. Just to save these uh, places, you know, that need to be saved rather than just uh, yeah. forgotten and destroyed. Another question. How do you manage to preserve architectural heritage, but at the same time adapt to modern uh, trends. It's very easy. Like, I mean, look, look again at Paris. Paris, like buildings are 200 years old and they're still standing and people are living happily inside of them and they integrated all, all the modern comfort, like you have double glazing, you have uh, uh, heating and air conditioning and uh, water and everything. It's very easy to to adapt, you know, and my place is 80 years old and I added everything needed, you know, to be able to live comfortably inside it. Um, I think people have to, you have to ra raise awareness. People have to um, realize the, the, the jewels that they have. You know, sometimes you have old people living inside uh, um, an old Lebanese house and they don't know that their ceiling is Baghdadi and it's worth a, th a thousand gypsum boards uh, for ceilings. It's important to, to explain to them that even though it's okay, it needs a bit of, uh, of maintenance and it's a bit tough, you know, it's a bit more expensive to, to maintain. It's, it has a lot more value than an, a new uh, gypsum board for ceiling, for example. There's another question and I like this one. I'm curious to know what your working space looks like currently. Now? Yeah. In Paris, you mean? I guess, are you working from home or like, what's your workspace? Like? Yeah, this is the space actually. <laughs> I, you know, it's very, like I, I can practically work from every, everywhere uh, as long as I have my, my computer and it's like I have a comfortable room, a quiet room. Uh, for example, we did a song with Nika uh, a month ago to raise funds for Beirut and I, I didn't have an apartment. Like my apartment, apartment was destroyed and all the gear and equipment like and musical instruments were uh, destroyed so i was working on this laptop at my parents house with a small keyboard so i, I always yeah. find you know solutions and you i adapt and this is the beauty of yeah and this is the beauty of working in a creative field because sometimes you just need a pen and a blank piece of paper or a napkin you know to to just to uh, find an idea and then translate it into reality Right, and you have your team that you work with. Yes, of course, and my I'm, yes, and I'm lucky because like the team can expand depending on the project. In a way, right. you know, a lot of people uh, discovered this with COVID that they were able to work, you know, from a distance and to have different team members all over the world, and it still can be very efficient. It's a bit more depressing because I love you know the contact with human beings, and I I love to discuss ideas alive with people in the room but like with with the zoom and whatsapp and everything it you can achieve a lot it's very easy it makes things easier yeah so Elise asking you touched on a key point that music and architecture require you to be inspired as as with other artwork 
Both of these creative processes require a great deal of mental energy, and it's often difficult enough to inspire yourself to work on just one of them. Can you share some of the motivation that pushes you to overcome this challenge? Mm, it's impossible to be inspired all the time. I often have, you know, I often have a week where I'm brain dead <laughs> and I just do nothing. But usually, I don't know where, where Eli lives, but usually going to nature, you know, going back to nature, going hikes, going to the mountain, going to the sea, going to a park in, in Paris or a museum, you, it helps you clear your, your mind and it reset, you know, it resets it in a way because it's impossible to, to be inspired all the time. For example, tomorrow I'm going to Normandy just to, and away from, you know, my phone and my laptop and the screens all the time. It's important to, to like I personally like to uh, see uh, um, an open view, like the sea or the ocean or the sky or, the sky or for a day. And then I'm able to get back at it. But sometimes I'm stuck for months, especially with what we lived like this year. It's very tough to be inspired. Like a lot of people, uh, people tell me, you know, you have the time now because you're not touring to write a new album. It's not that easy to, you know, to get inspired and write an album. You, you have to be on a certain mindset. You have to be comfortable. You have to be uh, psychologically <laughs> stable which we're not now. Well, but just like your music, your work is really powerful and it really evokes emotion. And I think we're all really excited to see what other projects you have coming in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And Nick is saying, when your website is fully up, please publish the floor plans of your projects. So yeah, I will. few architects do so. <laughs> yes, so, I will. Uh, it's a bit tricky with the clients because sometimes they don't want to show, you know, their the plans, but I will definitely share some of them. There is the plan of Villa Shams. It's available, I think, on Arsh Daily. Right. Yeah. Well, Carl, we love what you're doing, and uh, we're really excited to see some more. Thank you. Thank you. Of Thanks your work. a lot. Your projects speak a lot, and you have this certain style in your work where it really respects the, the context. And again, it's just like your music, how you're very honest with your music. I think your, your projects show that. So, Thank you. Uh, I'm very bad in giving advice. 